All right, this is the 2020 AOIME, which is the American Online Invitational Mathematics Examination, also called the AIME2, problem number eight. This is actually one of my favorite problems on the test that I've encountered so far um, for several reasons. Uh, it's going to require, well, they say it will require, uh, some ability to do recursion. Um, but what if you don't have that strength among your assets, your characteristics? You haven't developed doing recursion as an, as an asset for your, your uh, problem-solving skills yet. What do you do in that situation? We're going to get to that in this video. Probably don't skip around too much. Uh, I want you to hear these because we're going to go over some principles of problem-solving that apply to all problems, and we're going to illustrate it with this problem. Define a sequence of functions recursively by f1 of x equals the absolute value of x minus 1 and f sub n of x equals the f sub n minus 1 of the absolute value of x minus n. What does that mean? We'll get to it. For integers n greater than 1, find the least value of n such that the sum of the zeros of f sub n exceeds 500,000. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is what's called the deserted island principle. That's what I call it. Nobody else calls it this. The deserted island principle, deserted island, I can say this, uh, is basically what if you find yourself on a deserted island? Uh, for most of you, you're not going to know how to fish or how to spear hunt for animals and forage for berries. Unless you grew up a Boy Scout, you might know that one. And there are some of you who might have been Boy Scouts or various other groups that do the same thing. Um, so what do you do in that situation if you don't know how to do those things? Do you just write SOS on the beach and wait for a helicopter to fly by and hope you make it? No, you're going to go cut off a stick and sharpen it on some rocks and you're going spear hunting. You might not catch anything, but you're not going to lay on the beach and wait to die. And that's the principle that you have to apply on this problem. You might not have the skill of recursion in your, among your assets, your attributes that you uh, encounter the test with. A test is basically a collection of concepts. Some of those concepts are going to be your strengths, and some of them will, will be your weaknesses. If you get lucky, you get a test full of your strengths. Great! But what if you don't get lucky and you're not willing to give up? That's the ability that you need. Don't give up on a problem simply because you lack a perfected skill. Recursion is not one of my strengths, but I'm still going to get the problem correct by not being willing to give up and using powers of observation. So the first thing is, this is f sub 1 of x, and let's just go ahead and work with that. And you're looking for the zeros. Zeros means x-intercepts, or where the function is equal to zero. So if I set x minus 1 equal to zero, the only value that makes that work is 1. So x has to equal 1. So this is for f1. Um, also, notice I'm not writing of x and things like that. You want to have less and less notation as you advance through a problem. Because as long as it makes sense to you, that's all that matters. So what about f sub 2 of x? How do we understand what this is? Well, we're going to plug the 2 into n, which means it's equal to f sub 1 of uh, the absolute value of x minus the n, which in this case is 2 still. So you might think, oh, okay, so I have to plug this, right? I guess I'll put it for a second. I have to plug this into that x, which means it becomes this x, and you might have done something like this, um, and then said, that's equal to zero. You can do it from that point, but it's going to take longer. Just go to the zeros over here. x equals 1. That's the zero. That x is now this expression. And so you're going to get the absolute value of x minus 2, which is the x. x became this, right? f1 of this. The x is this. Then this has to equal 1, right? And you're going to know that x minus 2 equals 1, or x minus 2 equals negative 1. Add 2 to get x equals 3, or x equals 1. Okay, so we're kind of getting a feel for how the problem is working, which is what you want to do in the beginning. 
Okay, but let's think about, could we think about absolute value in a different way? Most people will read this as the absolute value of x minus one. That's how it's typically read, but there's another interpretation of absolute value of a difference, and that is the geometric interpretation. The distance between x and one is zero, right? And we could say the distance between x and two is one. Notice that three and one on a number line are one unit away from two. Maybe we can capitalize on that then. If we go to f of three, um, it's going to be uh, these values of x were the previous x for f of two, right? f of two x's, f of three being f of two of the absolute value of x minus three. So this right here becomes the x in f of two, and that x was equal to three and one. So we could say the distance between x and three, right, is equal to three, or the distance between x and three equals one. And if you solve both of those, um, if you go down three and up three from three, you'll get zero and six, and here you'll get two and four. And so you see that you're getting zeros that number one are different by two. And furthermore, the largest and smallest zero had to do with the largest zero's distance from the previous one became the distance from this center point of three, right? Where did this three come from? It came from the subscript of f. Okay, so if we do it one more time, let's make sure this actually works. You kind of want to confirm your suspicions. F sub four, again, this is of x, is equal to F sub three of x minus four. And again, the x here was zero, two, four, and six, okay? Then I need this to become the x, right? X was these values, this becomes that x. Now I say the distance between x and four is zero, and the distance between x and four is two, distance is four, and distance is six. Well, these are gonna hit all the numbers in between, right? If the distance between x and four is zero, then x is four. If the distance between x and four is two, then I'm gonna go down two and up two. If it's four, I'm gonna go down four and up four. And if it's six, I'm gonna go down six and up six. Notice that you hit every number in between with a difference of two. Um, and you can just focus on the largest zero, right? So now let's reclassify what we discovered. Let's think a bit about the distance concept instead. For f1 of x, the distance between um, one, which is the, the subscript here, a distance between one and the largest and smallest zero was zero. Um, so and, uh, yeah, extreme zeros, we'll call them, was zero. Now, we don't want to write all that out every time. So for f of two, it was the distance um, from two, and the extreme zeros was one. Let's go back and check. f of two, the distance between two, right, from on a number line, two is here, one here, three here. The distance from two, which was this n value, was one on either side, okay? So it was one. For f of three, the distance uh, between three and the extreme values was three. Let's check. If I look at f of three, it was zero, two, four, and six, and from three to zero is three, and from three to six is three. So you see how this is working. For f of four, we noticed that that distance was six, right? The distance from four and the extreme zeros was six. So now we have to use our powers of observation. What are these numbers over here? Well, if you have a lot of experience, and but if you made AIME or AOIME for that matter, you should have a decent amount of experience. You should recognize these. They are called the triangular numbers. It's because this is just zero, this is just one, this is one plus two, and this is one plus two plus three, and so on. It's the sum of the numbers, right, from one to that number. So now we have to figure out how do we capitalize on that 
And on this number, it looks like the 3 is 1 less than 4, and the 2 at the end of this is 1 less than 3. Well, the triangular numbers have a sum. It's basically 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus n. You can apply the arithmetic series formula, or you can just memorize the sum is n times n plus 1 over 2. Okay, but n is not the last number, not this n. This is your n right here, right? Because we're looking for f sub n, the subscript. Our subscript, this would be the n in this case, right? The last number in the series is not equal to n, it's 1 less than n. Therefore, this n in this problem, if I call this, call it something different so it helps. Let's say I stop it at v, right? Then if I stop at v, this is v, v plus 1 over 2. And actually, I want to make it y for a different reason. I'm going to use v later. So what is y? y is this number, which is 1 less than this number, and this number is n. So I'm going to let y equal n minus 1. You're just going to plug n minus 1 into here to get n minus 1 times n minus 1 plus 1, which is n, over 2. This represents the distance away from n that the smallest 0 and largest 0 is. So and again, all the zeros are separate by two in each and every case. Sometimes they're even, sometimes they're odds, but that's fine as long as we know what the center one is, we can capitalize on this. The center one is always four, or the n value rather. Um, okay, so what do we do with that? If this is the distance away from n, then we can find the smallest and largest zero. Okay, so I take n, the smallest one will be if I subtract the distance right? n times n minus 1 over 2. And if I do that, making this 2n over 2, it becomes 2n minus n squared plus n over 2, which is 3n minus n squared over 2. That is the smallest 0, right? Smallest 0. Sometimes it'll be negative, by the way, as you can see here. Um, and actually, we can test it real quick. Uh, this was for f of 4. If I plug 4 into here, 12 minus uh, 16 is negative 4 over 2 is negative 2. This is working. You should check your work as you go so that you're confident in your progress and what you're doing. It's not a waste of time. The other one, the largest 0, will be n plus n times n minus 1 over 2. Again, make this 2n over 2 to get 2n plus n squared minus n, which is going to be n squared plus n over 2. That's the largest zero. And what kind of series is this? Well, it's arithmetic, right? And so arithmetic series has a formula, and it helps if you understand where the formula came from, right? The formula, the way I like to remember it, I'm going to use a different letter, the V I talked about earlier. Um, because we don't want to use n because n means something else in our problem. So it's the average of the first and last term of your series, right? If you have a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus dot 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 plus a sub v, a v number of terms in your series, it's the average of the first and last, that's the average concept, times the number of terms v. Okay, so now how do we take this concept well, if this is my smallest and this is my largest, then if I add them together and divide by 2, I will get the average. Let's do that. 3n minus n squared over 2 plus n squared plus n over 2 over 2, because this, is, this are the zeros, then I'm going to find their average. This is this 2 right here is that one. Okay, so the n squareds cancel. 3n plus n is 4n over these 2 is going to become, well, I'll just write it. It's 4n over 2, but that's over 2 also. And this is 2n, and that's over 2, so this whole thing is n. So s sub v is n times v, the number of terms. But we don't want to use v now. We want to figure out how many terms there are. This is where basic fundamental concepts come in. If I have an arithmetic series from a to b, the number of terms is b minus a over the common difference plus 1. And we've already observed that the common difference is consistently 2. And we know what the last 0 is, the b, it's going to be this, and the first one is this. So let's calculate that. 
n squared plus n over 2 minus, I'm jumping all over the board, sorry, but uh, 3n minus n squared over 2, that is the b minus a part. Okay, let's calculate that real quick. n squared minus a negative n squared is 2n squared, and n minus 3n is negative 2n over 2, which is equal to n squared minus n. Now that's my b minus a. I still have to divide by the common difference, which we already know is 2. So then I'm going to get that it's n squared minus n over 2 plus 1. Okay? Uh, and you can test this on your own. If you don't remember the formula, make, make it. You can prove to yourself what it is. For example, let's say you went 4, 7, 10. How many numbers are there? 3. And if you can't remember if you add one or subtract one, you could do 10 minus 4 divided by the common difference, and you will get 2. But that's not the number of terms. And then you see you have to... So all these formulas can be derived in the heat of the moment. So if you forget one, derive it. Figure it out, right? You don't have to memorize all the formulas. Sure, it's helpful, but if you don't remember one, derive it, okay? So, back over to here. This is going to become 2 over 2 to make life easier, and now you're going to have n times n squared minus n plus 2 all over 2, okay? This is the sum of the zeros of the sequence, and we want this to be greater than 500,000. We see very nicely that 2 multiplies to give us 1 million, which you should also think of as 10 to the 6th. And now we're going to have n times n squared minus n plus 2 uh, needs to be greater than 1 million. Okay, so what do we do then? Uh, just trial and error, right? If I distribute this n, smart trial and error, you will get n cubed minus n squared plus 2n. If I plug in, you know, 100 uh, is 10 squared, and if I cube that, I will get 10 to the 6th. But the problem is if I subtract, right, I'm going to get the 1 million here. Minus n squared will be uh, 1 with 4 zeros, so it's 10,000. And then plus this, it's not going to go over a million with that. Okay. But what if we just, we're pretty close though, we can tell. Let's try 101. And for that, I'm going to use this one. So it's 101 times. And if you want to do 101 squared, it's helpful to remember that the difference in consecutive squares is the sum of the bases. Okay, it's a very worthwhile nugget of knowledge to remember. Um, so if we know that 100 squared is 10,000, I can add the sum of the bases, namely 100 and 101, to this to know that 101 squared is 10,201. We will then subtract 101 and add 2. Uh, this is going to be 101 times 10,102. Now, we can tell at a glance this is greater than a million. We don't need to do it. Because if this was 100 and that was 10,000, it would be equal to a million, but both numbers are greater than those numbers. So this is going to work, and 101 is the answer, right? So again, don't give up because it includes a concept that you're not comfortable with. All of you should know the basics of an arithmetic series by now. And if you just use your powers of observation, and a kind of a key one saves some time, you don't have to observe it, but the distance between x and 1 in an absolute value, that interpretation of this is going to save you a little bit of time, maybe a couple minutes or something like that, until you recognize that in the problem. I mean, if you recognize it, it'll save a couple minutes off your total task time. So that's about it. The answer is 101. See you in the next video.